A million years ago, Italy was a battlefield, where enormous, violent volcanoes offered competing displays of bursts of fire, lava flows, clouds of hot ash, and showers of lapilli. They raised mountains and erased valleys. It was a mineral world. There was no room for plants or animals. Then, a hundred thousand years ago, one by one, the volcanoes stopped erupting. Drain gradually filled the ancient craters, turning them into lakes. It was the beginning of a new adventure for life, which this time conquered the land of volcanoes. not extinct. Even today, ancient volcanoes continue to mutter away underground in central Italy and push columns of gas saturated with sulfur to the surface, causing the water that collects in the bottom of the craters to bubble. One such is the Caldera of Manciana, a wide depression a few hundred meters across the active remains of the ancient Sabatino volcano. On the banks is a forest of birch, trees typical of the far north, which usually grow in the taiga of Scandinavia and Siberia, but here can grow at sea level, in the heart of the Mediterranean. They probably arrived in Manciana 12,000 years ago, during the last ice age, when glaciers covered much of this region. A refuge for species that love the cold and water. At the center of the caldera, is a constantly erupting geyser, surrounded by pools and springs, where the underground gas transforms rainwater into sparkling, sulfur-flavored water. It is blue, milky, and not much suited to sustaining life. Here, there is a kind of reed, equipped with a special system for expelling excessive sulfites. However, the turbid water is ideal for ambushing. There is no escape for a tadpole that has passed too close to the dragonfly's jaws, which are prodigious tools for capturing prey. The insect can capture as many as three or four tadpoles a day, but may also fast for a week. It is the most formidable predator in these pools. Only one in a hundred tadpoles becomes a frog. But that is the law of nature. Sulfur saturates the soil, the air, and the water, which flows, cutting into the rocks, opening the way to the river Mignone, the main stream in the area, and from there to the volcanic lake that has formed in the main crater. But it is a journey of hundreds of kilometers through a tormented landscape that retains many vestiges of ancient volcanic activity. The Rio Lupo, as this small stream of sulfurous water is called, looks uninviting. 
Here you can find half the periodic table in a drop of water. It was a laboratory of chemical compounds which aroused the interests of the inhabitants of the area since ancient times. The first to exploit the deposits of sulphur and iron, but also of gold and silver, were the Etruscans. Their necropolises are carved into the rock. They are fascinating because they are immersed in a natural landscape, the same that must have existed in this area when they were constructed a few centuries before Christ. Cave bush crickets like Etruscan tombs. They feel safe in the darkness. Thanks to their long antenna and hair, they are able to meet partners and to find their special food, droppings left by bats. The plants and animals probably have not changed since that far off time either. Like the Tyranian lizard and the gecko, small reptiles that hide in the rocks and hunt insects. Like the kestrel, a small falcon that nests in the rocks and hunts lizards and geckos. The air is cold, but the water that bubbles up from underground is warm, forming a fog that even sunlight cannot fade. These are toxic clouds, and on still nights they linger on the ground. They are a death trap for animals, which asphyxiate before they know what has happened. Crows know they will find a carcass to eat, but prudently wait for the breeze to clear the air. This time, it is a badger who suffers. It's a strong and courageous animal that will take on any enemy, but is helpless in the face of toxic mists and is very vulnerable because of its short stature. The torrent of sulfurous, toxic water runs along the bottom of the canyon, eroding the soft and friable tufa rock which was formed by the ash of the last eruption 600,000 years ago. In this stretch of the river there are no fish, insects, frogs or salamanders. They would die in a few moments. But there is one brave creature that has decided to defy the ban on swimming. The green woodpecker is a smart bird and it knows the sulphurous water keeps pests away from its feathers. Of course, it will smell of sulphur, but even people like to immerse themselves in the sulphurous thermal waters that are also good for the skin. Wild bees have built their nest high up, where the air is pure and the sulphur fumes cannot reach. The wax combs are hanging on a rocky ledge and hang straight down following the laws of gravity. Now the bees have moved and have collected in a compact swarm hanging from the branches of an olive tree. They are protecting their queen, waiting for the completion of the nest the explorers have found not far from here. The toxic environment dominated by volcanic chemistry seems to influence all aspects of life. Even the plants dedicate themselves to chemical experiments. Over the course of the millennia, in fact, the presence of herbivores have led the plants to defend themselves with toxic substances. Livestock avoid the toxic milk of the euphorbia, 
almost all insects do the same. The Euphorbia hawk moth caterpillar is the only animal in Europe which is able to feed on the poisonous leaves of this plant in order to transform into a beautiful olive and pink butterfly. The sulfurous water is now diluted, continuously oxygenated by the rushing stream it has changed in appearance, it no longer smells of sulfurs and has become transparent. It still has a sour taste but is drinkable, at least for a thirsty badger. Now the river can accommodate one of the rarest and most endangered creatures in the Mediterranean. A small amphibian that is only found in this area. The spectacled salamander. This small animal, no longer than a finger, sports a striking white, red and black colouring to indicate that the little creature's toxic skin makes it dangerous. It is inedible for any predator. But that does not mean it is not threatened by habitat changes caused by men. Fortunately, this area has been spared, and every year dozens of specimens spawn. The salamanders are usually invisible. For 360 days a year, they live hidden in the woods. Then, for less than a week, they rush en masse to small pools of cold water to fix their gelatinous eggs to submerged twigs. Having deposited the eggs, they return to hide under rocks and logs. From now on, no one will know they exist until next year. The night and the forest hide salamanders and other amphibians from the eyes of their enemies. Many orthoptera dedicate the night to reproduction. The banks of the river, covered with thick bushes, are the favourite haunt of many species of crickets. The delicate Acromitopoda lays its eggs in the branch of a tree after etching the bark with its razor-sharp ovipositor. All this happens in total darkness which protects it, although not always. The tarantula has no holes and does not weave webs. It hunts by chasing like a wild dog. Its bite is painful to humans, but not usually dangerous, the books tell us. We never tested it, but for the bush cricket, the bite is surely deadly. The body of the prey is transformed into a protein shake and will be sucked through the jaws. Somebody will clean the crime scene as soon as the sun rises. The river continues its journey through the Marema, one of the most sparsely inhabited regions in Italy. Some woods have not been cut down for many decades and have gradually returned to their natural state, filling with fallen, rotting logs eaten away by fungi, bacteria and arthropods.
Ants play an important role in the cycle of organic matter, particularly the species that feed on wood, such as Cremotogaster ants. There is a nest of ants, colony or hive, around every 10 metres. Probably their number exceeds that of all the other inhabitants of the wilderness put together. Inside every nest, organised chaos reigns. Many workers have yellow heads. They are newly metamorphosed specimens whose bodies are so pale and tender that they cannot be exposed to the outside world, but are restricted to caring for the young in the darkness of the hive. Later, when their heads turn red and their bodies darken and harden, they will be ready to carry out their duties outside, including fiercely defending the nest from attacks by enemies, biting and spraying formic acid. Ants have a few enemies, including the Italian lacewing, but their worst enemies are perhaps others of their own kind. Fighting continuously breaks out between individuals from different species, each with a distinctive odour that acts like a uniform or identity card. Small red ants consider Camponotus ants their fiercest enemies. A small team of red ants explores the territory of a colony of Camponotus. They are immediately spotted by their cousins and the chase begins. This time, the larger ants can easily arrest the invasion. There are no survivors. Their bodies will be stored in the spacious underground storage area. The Rio Lupo has now become the river Mignone and flows through an ever deeper, ever more shadowy gorge, where the sun reaches the bottom for only a few moments a day. The humidity is so high that tiny water droplets condense on the trunks and branches, providing moisture for ferns and mosses. Mosses are real sponges that play an irreplaceable role in the life of the forest, absorbing water when it is abundant and giving it back slowly when in short supply, making it available to all the creatures living in the gorge. Moss is used by blue tits to line the cavity where they deposit their eggs. Long-tailed tits, on the other hand, use a very special material, lichens. These are finely woven to form a soft bag that these relative of the blue tits have hidden in the tangle of branches. Tits and other insectivorous birds have healthy appetites. They devour a prodigious amount of caterpillars and help protect plants from many pests. but they are not able to deal with a living fortress like the caterpillar of the gypsy moth. These caterpillars covered with stinging hairs are practically invulnerable. There is only one animal able to take them on. Calisoma is a beetle with an insatiable appetite. It begins to eat the caterpillar when it is still alive. Its glittering armour protects it from the hairs while the mandibles cut up the victim. 
Once rendered harmless, the caterpillar turns into an edible jelly and the beetle can eat dozens in a single day. So much so that there are those who follow it to take advantage of a free snack. Calosoma beetles are a real problem for these moths because out of a thousand eggs, only one becomes a chrysalis. But one moth can create a generation of hundreds of caterpillars. The great oaks that grow on the ashes of the ancient volcano seem to know that there will be more infestations of caterpillars and stand there, solid, ready to face the next attack. The stream has plenty of water in the spring, the time when most aquatic insects decide to reproduce. Pebbles and plants are the theatre of the amorous passions of the damselflies. Male damselflies are territorial and spend much of their time on their perches, from which they depart for short flights of display or to hunt. If a female approaches the male, he chases her and grabs her around the neck with his cherchi. These aerobatics end with the characteristic heart-shaped pose during which the male transfers the sperm into the female genital cavities. The small fish surviving in the deeper pools are native species and sometimes do not even have a common name. They have evolved over time in completely isolated worlds, developing an exceptional ability to overcome the drought by taking refuge in tiny pools. solitary ruin overlooks the land of volcanoes. It belongs to the town of Canale Monterano, which flourished until the 18th century. People lived on the banks of the river and built mills to grind wheat and olives using the power of the water. But today, the situation is very different. war and disease forced the villagers to move away. There is no one left, the place is deserted and the village is abandoned and in ruins. This small village has been abandoned by people, but not by animals. During the night, squares, courtyards and streets are animated by a number of creatures which are invisible during daylight. Wild boars come out of the bush to feed on roots and earthworms, while a pine marten carefully marks with its scent its personal home range. When the sun rises, all night citizens are ready to hide among the walls and bushes of the old ruined town but some do not care too much to hide. Badgers and porcupines are among them. 
porcupines are the largest European rodents and they make their dens among the ruins. Now they hunt in daylight. The last poachers have retired and these animals no longer have enemies. A small fountain has resisted the ravages of time and man. It is a paradise for the wood frogs. Other amphibians have chosen an unusual spot in which to reproduce. The toads are in love. Males and females congregate in areas they have inhabited since time immemorial to renew their courtship, mating and spawning. These have chosen the flooded necropolis close to Canale Monterano that dates back 25 centuries. There are still many toads here, but their numbers are decreasing dramatically in much of Europe. Their extinction is taking place in silence, with few aware of it. On its journey to the crater lake, the stream has deposited elegant concretions that hang down like columns from almost vertical walls. It is a difficult hunting ground, but not impossible for the most agile of carnivores. A marten raises an alarmed reaction from the lord of the ravine, the peregrine falcon. The marten has found something interesting at the base of the cliff, but the whip snake is a tough nut to crack. It is strong and aggressive and cannot be caught from behind. The marten had better look for easier prey. These rocks are also frequented by the most acrobatic of insectivorous birds, the wall creeper which meticulously explores every crack looking for small insects and spiders. The wall creeper is fluttering not far from the falcon's nest, but it knows it will be safe if it keeps close to the rocks. The peregrine falcon is the fastest and the most skilled of the winged hunters, but needs a lot of space for its aerial maneuvers. No hawk would be crazy enough to risk slamming into a rock wall at 300 kilometers an hour to catch a prey of a few grams. The peregrine falcon chicks have now grown and are ready to leave their nest, located in a cleft of the rocks overlooking the river. But they must be careful, they could fall. If they fell, there would be no protection, the current would sweep them away. but the desire to get out of the narrow hole where they have lived for weeks is too strong. Finally, the day of their escape from the nest arrives. Taking advantage of the wind, the young falcons have landed on top of the gorge. Even a plant becomes an excuse to play to flex their lethal claws and master their strong, sharp beaks. But then, as sometimes happens between sisters, they begin to fight. These are games of survival that prepare them for a life of daring dives and territorial disputes. The sooner they gain experience, the better. On its journey to the crater lake, the stream forms a waterfall. It is just two meters high, but it is a difficult obstacle for fish. Once 
once a year, the shad have to swim against the current to spawn. The abundance of fish has attracted a flock of cormorants. It is hard to understand how cormorants can find fish in water so muddy that there are only a few inches of visibility, but they do. In fact, they seem to enjoy the swift currents that hurl themselves against the rocks. This is the avant-garde of cormorant flocks, which congregate in the lake of Bracciano, the great basin formed in the extinct volcano, the final destination of the waters of the small stream. The great basin appears in all its majesty beyond the crest of the crater. This is Lake Bracciano, the eighth largest lake in Italy, the final destination of the waters of the Rio Lupo. It is perfectly circular, 15 kilometers in diameter and about 50 kilometers in circumference. It is like a small, freshwater sea. And just like the sea, it can become stormy when the mistral wind blows. Gulls ride the gusts, maneuvering against the wind that is now blowing at over 40 knots. The black-headed gulls are migratory. They have come here from northern Europe to spend the winter. waves sweep the pier of one of the small towns on the shore of the lake. A crow needs to be careful not to be swept away by the water. The lake is a fishing reserve for the cormorants that arrive in large numbers at the beginning of winter. After fishing, they must dry their feathers and they perch on poles, exposing their open wings to the wind. They are heavy birds, graceful in the water, but rather clumsy in flight. Each takeoff or landing requires a certain effort. There are many adults, but also many young, with white bellies, born last summer on some remote cliff overlooking the Baltic Sea. When the wind drops, the lake is transformed into a mirror. Lake Bracciano has only a small tributary and a modest outlet so it takes a long time for the water to change. It takes over a hundred years for the water of the lake to be completely renewed, longer than for the waters of the Mediterranean to be replaced through the Strait of Gibraltar. This has been the salvation of Lake Placiano, but it is also the reason for its extreme vulnerability. If the lake became tainted with pollutants, it would be an absolute environmental disaster. Fortunately, it continues to be filled with clear water. It is a reserve of five billion cubic meters of water for Rome and a wetland of European-wide interest for waterfowl that can rely on water free from the ice even in the coldest winters. The great crested grebes practice deep sea fishing in these waters. They live, sleep and eat in the water. Their plumage is fully waterproof and their bodies hydrodynamic, allowing for quick, silent diving that does not alert the fish. They can dive to as much as 60 meters and remain underwater for more than half a minute. 
black-necked grebes like to live in small groups and go fishing away from the shore to try to find schools of small fish. If something threatens them from above, their response is immediate. There are many coots and diving ducks, such as the common pochard, from the Baltic region and Eastern Europe. They dive noisily, lacking the elegance of grebes, but they are not worried about fish escaping, as they feed on shellfish and aquatic plants. They are among the few birds that can feed themselves far from the shore. Lake Bracciano, in fact, reaches a depth of 165 metres, and since the banks go down steeply, it is mainly suitable for diving birds or the giraffes of the lake. Swans. A pair of swans gently courting. These birds stay together all year and for many years in a row. They are the very symbol of conjugal love. Or so it seems. DNA analysis of cygnets has revealed a disturbing fact. At least a third of the cygnets do not carry the genes of the mother's partner. And there is only one explanation. In one area of the lake, the shore slopes more gently and a dense reed bed has grown up because the storks are able to anchor their roots to the lake bed and to allow their ears full of seeds to emerge from the water. Eurasian penduline tits are carefully exploring the reeds. They seem to have found something interesting nestled in the stalks. Although it looks like a small chicken, the water rail is related to the crane. It has long toes and a strong beak, which it uses to rummage through the mud and among the reeds in search of small animals. It is not easy to spot, but its loud cry sounds like a pig squealing, hence its Italian name, Porciglione, which means little pig. In the evening, one of the rarest and most endangered birds in Europe goes into action. The bittern is a large heron with plumage the colour of dried reeds. It is perfectly camouflaged. Its every movement is slow and studied to make sure it is not spotted by enemies and enable it to stalk its prey. It dips its beak into the water like a sensor to locate a fish or a shrimp through detecting vibration. There are only a few thousand couples left in Europe and the volcanic lakes and reed beds are an important natural refuge for this species. Every day, as sunset approaches, the marsh harrier explores the banks of the lake. It flies lightly, its path seemingly random, but it is hunting methodically, systematically sweeping the edge of the reed bed for hours. Sooner or later, it will take one of the less cautious creatures by surprise.
Each year, when spring comes, the starlings that have spent the winter on the shores of the lake congregate in large groups. They gather their strength, close ranks, and prepare for the migratory flight that will take them to central and eastern Europe, more than 2,000 kilometers away from Lake Bracciano. They have decided to sleep on the banks of the lake because it is sheltered from the wind and from predators. They land in fields where the wheat is beginning to sprout for a final supper before going to sleep. There are thousands, tens of thousands of them. A buzzard dives into the group, hoping to capture a stray bird in the confusion, but the starlings move in unison and form a compact wall that wards off any attack. Starlings are not afraid of the giant, colourful bird that flies through the sky with them and gradually take up residence on their roosts. It is their last night on the shores of the volcanic lake. Tomorrow they leave. On the banks of the crater, the oaks are still bare, but the hoopoos have arrived. A multicolored carpet of flowers is visited first by insects in search of nectar. These are flowers that bloom in the undergrowth before the trees get their leaves in order to take advantage of a few weeks of light. Many insects are searching for nectar. Others devote themselves to procuring materials to build nests. Bumblebees are busy in their underground nest. On the shores of the lake, mud daubers collect mud for their small earthenware nests. They are shaped like amphora and the larvae grow inside. At metamorphosis, they break the operculum and free themselves from their casing. Then, fly away, with no one to guide them or teach them how to build mud nests. But you can be sure that in a year, they will make them perfectly. The reeds protect the broods of waterfowl, keeping them safe from terrestrial predators. No fox can go deep into the water to reach the coot's raft or raid a brood of small hens. A pair of more hens busy with their young. More hen chicks are autonomous, meaning they can swim despite being born just a few hours earlier, but they need to be encouraged by the full buffet of treats the lakeside can offer. The adults never let down their guard because the threat can come from underwater as well as from above. Because there are watchful eyes peering down at what is happening below. The black kites have returned to the shores of the lake. They have spent the winter in Africa, south of the Sahara, and crossed the desert and the sea to get here. They are light, with long, broad wings, and can glide effortlessly, brushing by each other as they mark out the borders of their nesting area in the woods overlooking the lake shore. Spring is spawning time for most amphibians. Crested newts congregate in shallow pools, plenty of plants to court their females. These small water dragons are much larger than common newts, which have already started to fix their eggs to plant leaves and stems. On 
on the banks, the army of European green toads that have wintered in deep tunnels is getting ready to move. Each burrow is inhabited by one, two, three toads that wait until nightfall to go out onto the lake to spawn. They fear the heat and the sun's rays. But today, the toads do not have to wait for the evening to come out of their shelters because something extraordinary is happening, an astronomical event that has not occurred for almost 20 years. It is the eclipse of the spring equinox. The moon slowly eats into the disk that gives life to the planet. The animals are quick to get into the water. Intimidated by this terrifying event, the toads are silent. Then the sun shines again on this land forged by volcanoes and its lake, and the concert of songs and calls rises again. The sun has defeated the moon, just as a hundred thousand years ago the water defeated the fire of the earth. Life can continue on its course on the shores of this lake, which is as old as the volcano that it has replaced.